Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Dr. Satyajit Rath from National Institute of Immunology. Satyajit, the thing that has been sort of going around recently is the malaria vaccine. We have had Times of India extol about it in great detail. We have had even New York Times has commented on it as a major development. This vaccine, which has had some field trials now, some results are available, talks about 47% cover, if you will, of uh, for small children uh, regarding malaria infections, also claimed to be the first vaccine against parasites. Now, what do you think this represents? So, this is the vaccine from GlaxoSmithKline that uh, was initially made in the U.S. Army laboratories and uh, since then has been developed by GSK in association with the PATH Malaria Vaccine Initiative, which is a multilateral uh, public interest consortium. Um, there is, as is evident, a very substantial financial and otherwise interest of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's an interesting vaccine because it is a truly genetically modified protein. So it takes the surface coat protein or a fragment of the surface of one of the surface coat proteins of falciparum malaria and it's from the life stage of the malarial parasite that mosquitoes inject into the body. It then stitches this fragment of protein to a protein from the hepatitis B virus against which we have a very good vaccine. The nice thing about the hepatitis B virus protein is that it forms ordered particles by itself. You make the protein, you put it in appropriate physiological uh, solution and it clusters. So it creates particles. So this fusion protein also creates particles. And particles are much better to generate an immune response, to trigger an immune response, than dissolved proteins are. So in this sense, it's a nice little uh, vaccine candidate that's been around for a long time. It's very slowly gone through a number of clinical trials. Uh, it's phase two clinical trials in Africa. Remember, this is falciparum malaria. So inevitably, trials have been almost entirely, as far as I can recollect, in Africa, in a whole range of countries. Um, and all the phase two trials, which are small trials, uh, have succeeded. Incidentally, they started with human volunteers who agreed to be vaccinated and then deliberately infected with malaria to see whether uh, they could be successfully infected or not. And that's where efficacy was shown to some extent and therefore that's how it was started. Now, the nice thing about this trial is that this is a phase three trial. It's a large scale trial. Many thousands of children 16,000 I believe are uh, uh, to be recruited. The trial has two components. One is very small babies, six week, 10 week, 12 week old babies. Remember, our um, immunization program for children in public health, we usually do the bulk of our vaccinations in that age. So if at the public health level you have to introduce yet another vaccine, that would be the age to introduce it at, logistically, expenditure-wise, and so on and so forth. But they've also got a greater than one year age, between one to two years age, I forget the exact um, month slot, group of children in whom also vaccination has been done and uh, results are to be generated. Now, the trial is to go until 2014. Okay. So, they have done a mid-trial analysis and they have determined that the second group of children, the one year plus group of children, shows a significant protection with the vaccine against attacks of malaria doesn't change deaths due to malaria. It does improve the severe attacks of malaria, the very uh, severely ill uh, um, uh, children. That frequency has gone down as well. But if they pool both groups, the effectiveness of the vaccine comes down. So what that suggests possibly, 
is that the very young babies being immunized may not be as well protected, number one. Number two, the bulk of the protection is being seen within the first year. The trial has only just begun. Now, other people have done this. They haven't, the authors haven't done this. Other people have done this. That if you split their data into protection early after vaccination and protection towards the end of the first year after vaccination, protection towards the end of the first year after, vac uh, after vaccination tends to be a little lower. Now, one doesn't know if this is the case or not. In all of this, therefore, there isn't really a vaccine as far as anybody can tell right now. There may be, there may not be. What there is, is some glimmering of an indication that there may be a vaccine. This is better than any other anti-malarial or anti-parasite vaccine that we've seen. And to that extent, the enthusiasm is, I suspect, uh, warranted to some extent. But it's curious that uh, rather than waiting until 2014, which after all is not that far away, they've chosen to do a midterm analysis and to release both uh, a publication and uh, maybe even more importantly, an announcement by uh, Mr. Bill Gates in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation meeting um, that here is a vaccine. They're also talking about introducing this by 2015. Now, if the trials are going to end by, 20, end by 2014, is that possible as a date to introduce the vaccine itself, one year within so, that? So, um, WHO has said, again unusually, that if the present data hold up in the next set of analyses, See, once you begin to do interim analysis, you can do a whole range of interim analyses. So if they hold up in the next set of analyses, which will be towards the end of next year, and if they hold up at the end of the trial, which is 2014, then because it has gone through a protracted set of clinical trials over recent years, WHO will feel comfortable with these provisos in saying in 2015 that it should be introduced. This is coupled to the fact that GSK has said that it will cost this vaccine, that it will price this vaccine at production cost plus a token amount of additional cost which GSK has said, I have not seen the original uh, commitments, but GSK appears to have said that it will undertake to invest in a next generation vaccine because everybody admits and agrees that even if this vaccine works, we are going to want a better vaccine. Manufacturing cost plus recovery of the R&D cost, which Glaxo, Smith & Klein has said is about $300 million. I don't know. So whether the manufacturing cost is just manufacturing cost plus a percentage of uh, other cost. And as you know, the major cost as far as drug companies are concerned have always been about the R&D cost, not about the cost of manufacturing. So that, that itself makes it, you know, okay, we'll take this on uh, face value, but it's not as clear that it will be affordable in that sense. Oh, not at all. Um, as a matter of fact, I haven't seen any realistic estimates of what it would cost to put it into actual regular immunization schedules for children in um, middle and low income um, countries. Um, also, we have this notion that vaccines are going to solve our problem. Clearly, that's not the case. So, apropos of which, there is a statistic that we would be doing well to keep in mind. Remember, this is a trial in extremely poor African countries. Um, in fact, one of the remarkable things about the trial, one of the nice things about the trial, is that scientists from African countries were involved fairly intimately in the doing of the trial, which is always a nice thing. But this is in very poor countries. Yet, simply by virtue of being recruited into the trial, deaths from malaria have been extremely few in this group of uh, children, to the extent that you cannot even get statistically significant differences simply because there have been so few deaths. Why have there been so few deaths? Because Given that they are part of the trial, the children have gotten proper medical care and attention. Um, so effectively what we run into the danger of saying 
is that in, because we either cannot or do not choose to provide the medical care that ought to be the right of everybody, we will substitute it with a vaccine. There are difficulties with this. I think that's a very telling point also because a lot of the single issue programs which have come into Africa distort the public health scenario, but that's really a discussion for another day perhaps. But I would like to come back to you on the issue of vaccine itself. Most vaccines we know are really almost 100% effective and that's what we know the vaccines to be. So what does a 30-40% vaccine protection really mean? At the individual level, that's perfectly true. Um, should, <coughs> will individuals take a vaccine, that's only 30 or 40% effective. Now, many of uh, um, uh, the people of young India may not uh, even remember it, but you and I certainly remember the so-called TABC vaccine for typhoid, paratyphoid, cholera, etc. that we used to uh, get that showed between 30 to 40 percent efficacy over the first year. And that was discontinued, or at least has fallen um, outside widespread usage. We also had a TB vaccine, if I remember correctly, no? well, BCG we, vaccine. We, we still have a BCG vaccine. We still continue to use it because in very small children for certain illnesses, it is clearly effective. Uh, but yes, it's not certainly universally effective. The issue here is whether the individual is protected or not is one question. Whether for an infectious disease you can break the transmission cycle in the community enough to bring down exposure frequency and therefore bring down the total numbers of cases happening every year or not, these become two separate questions. For large public health infectious disease problems, um, public health authorities, agencies tend to think in terms of at least breaking the transmission cycle, if not achieving individual protection. In individual protection is the ultimate ideal goal. Now, more than 90% uh, protective efficacy would be wonderful. But most public health agencies tend to think that if you can manage to achieve the break in transmission cycle, you've contributed. I'm inclined to think that that would be a nice thing. But Satyajit, again, studies have been conducted on what kind of interventions are required for breaking the transmission cycle. And it comes down to that you really target the families where there are infections. If you have the public health system to do so, that's much more likely to break the transmission cycle than an intervention at the generic level of society as a whole. So I would agree that it's certainly um, a proven method for intervening effectively. All said and done, medicated bed nets work very well when the program works. Um, I would argue that it's at least plausible uh, in an academic sense to think about a vaccine that breaks the transmission cycle. So WHO, for example, has said that if we can have a vaccine with 50% efficacy maintained over one year post-vaccination, it will be a significant addition in the portfolio of choices for intervention. Nobody is pretending that the vaccine is going to replace anything else. But I think that there is still an issue about single disease focused approaches uh, in not quite in contrast to, but effectively in competition to far more integrated approaches to public health. And uh, every vaccine hype, deserved or otherwise, tends to worry me from that point of view. Getting out of this malaria issue, there's a larger issue that is there regarding drugs itself. That, for instance, after the artemisinin's uh, introduction, we really haven't had a malaria drug. Uh, the malaria, last malaria drug for tuberculosis is about, I think, 40 years, 45 years back. Now, do you think that this is a, that we have really reached some kind of scientific limit? Or is it really that there, there is not enough money in research there's not enough attention for actually having drugs against what are called the forgotten diseases. Forgotten, I don't know by whom, but certainly they are the most prevalent diseases which kill in the world today. I think it's a little bit of both. This is completely prejudice, mine, 
in this case, but I think it's a little bit of both. In the first place, I think that there is, um, it's getting, in science terms, it's getting harder to find targets, simply because the most obvious and the easiest targets that distinguish microbial infectious agents from us, which are the targets that we would like to make drugs against, many of those already have drugs against them. So it's that much harder to find new ones. It's also easier to find drugs against bacteria, for example, than against parasites, because parasites are eukaryotes like us. Bacteria are a whole different uh, category of life forms altogether. So the distinctions are more stark and therefore drugs are easier to find. That said, I don't think it's impossible to find targets. I do think that it is necessary to commit to far more widespread, far more, shall we say, non-linear efforts to find targets. Um, and our present modality for finding targets, which is really pharmaceutical industry driven, much more product patent driven, tends to try to minimize risk and therefore tends to try to stay within empirically accepted parameters based on prior experience with drugs for the purpose of finding new drugs. That essentially locks you into a relatively um, small subset of the potential operating terrain for drug finding. And unless we shift away from that into a public sector, public interest, public good um, effort that's much more broad ranging, um, my guess is that we are always going to have this difficulty of self-restricted drug discovery space. Thank you very much, Satyajit, for sharing with us your views and your knowledge about these areas and these issues. We'll follow them with you as we go along. I think that we have a long way to go on this as yet. We Thanks. certainly do.